We're in the Herbert Lehman Center at Columbia University. Uh, this is a center established in honor of the governor of New York during the Great Depression, and that's the period we're talking about with Professor Linda Gordon, who is our visitor today. Professor Gordon is professor of history at New York University. She's also one of the leading experts in 20th century women's history. So we're going to start by talking to her about women during the Great Depression, and particularly about what happens when government policies begin to impact women's lives. So if you don't mind, Linda, can we start by asking, you know, here and especially after 1935, there are a range of government policies that affect women of all kinds. Can you talk about some of them to us and what differences they made in the lives of women? Sure, I'd be glad to. You know, government has often affected women, and sometimes indirectly. One of the things that was really different about the Great Depression is that it was a time when the federal government, as opposed to state and local governments, began moving into areas to help people. And some of those programs really helped women. Some of them actually discriminated against women. So we're talking about a very mixed bag. Give us some examples of programs that benefited and didn't benefit women. Well, there were two agencies actually within the federal government that were very much women-centered. One of them was called the U.S. Women's Bureau. But even before that, there was a, a 1912 creation, the U.S. Children's Bureau. And it's very important to understand that almost anything that's focused on children is fundamentally about women, because in those days, everyone assumed that children were the responsibility of women. And women cared very much about child welfare. And in fact, in general, whenever you've had child welfare, uh, anything that helps the well-being of children, it has been women that pushed for it. And those two offices within the federal government became centers in which really for the first time you began to have significant numbers of federal civil servants who were women and others were political appointees who began to work within the government to try to make changes. One of the things that these two uh, agencies working together brought about for the first time is a program that later became called simply welfare, but uh, precisely was called aid to dependent children. That was extremely helpful to women. Uh, Tell us which women that helped or okay. how that helped women. Aid to dependent children was really important for women who were stuck without men to help them support their children, meaning without a husband or a father or even a boyfriend who, who might have helped. And a good guide to the need for age-dependent children is the fact that in the year 1900, the orphanages in the United States, uh, the majority of the children in those orphanages were not what we call orphans. They were the children of single mothers who simply couldn't find any way to both care for their children and earn enough to support them. And so in the period before the Great Depression, there were some state programs known as mother's pensions that gave a little bit of aid to women who were caught in that position. They were predominantly widows, but they might also be divorced women or just women who had been separated from their husbands or who had been deserted by their husbands. But were they what we would call good women? I mean, what, what happened to women who the state who had just had children out of wedlock. Did they get mother's pensions too? No, the, the, programs, uh, the state programs of mother's pensions were both very, very moralistic and also very racially discriminatory. The majority of the recipients were women that would be called white, uh, leaving out African-American women, uh, Latinas, um, but even sometimes uh, Italian immigrant women or uh, Syrian immigrant women. Uh, furthermore, these mother's pensions programs were just a drop in the bucket. They were very, very small in relation to the need 
um, one of the things that was only recently discovered when more census data was released is that already in the year 1900, somewhere between 9 and 10 percent of children in the United States already were dependent on single mothers. Uh, a lot of people really didn't understand that. They sort of assume no. that every child has a typical nuclear family with a husband and a wife, and that has never uh, never been the case, especially right. because uh, many more men died young in those days from industrial accidents or industrial disease. That's an astonishing figure that nearly 10 percent of children had single mothers raising them. So what happens in 1935 when ADC, Aid to Dependent Children, is created? The Great Depression, combined with the new sense of possibility created by the Franklin Roosevelt administration in the whole set of programs that we call the New Deal, showed these women who had jobs in the Children's Bureau, for example, that federal aid for the first time was going to be possible. And they lobbied very, very hard to create this program called Aid to Dependent Children. It was not perfect. The federal money had to be matched by money from the states, and if it wasn't matched, if the states were not willing to contribute, there, were, there would be no program in that state. Um, that, even that program was racially discriminatory because the determination of who was eligible was left to the states. Ah, so, so did that mean that a, for example, a black woman even if she were eligible, might get less income, less money per week to live on than a white woman? That is true, but it is also true that in a state like Mississippi or Arkansas, most black women applicants were simply denied. How, how was that? Why was that? Because they found all sorts of ways to label them as ineligible. The most common was accusing them of sexual immorality, because uh -huh. women had to prove that they were fit parents. And for example, a woman who had beer bottles in her house would be determined unfit because it was considered absolutely taboo for women to be drinking in that period. Um, even though prohibition had been repealed, there was still a tremendous uh, set of just uh, prejudice about people who drank. But for example, um, African-American families were often composed of women alone with children or women being in a, in a household with men who they were not married to. Uh, but you know, the fact is that in a lot of these southern states you really didn't need a reason because they had such control. In the northern states it was somewhat better. But it is a great irony that later on this program called ADC, the the public image was of black women, but in fact, for at least the first full decade, uh, the overwhelming majority of people who were receiving ADC were, were white mm -hmm. women. But was the assumption behind the program that women who got aid would then be able to stay home with their children? I, I ask this question because we've been learning that the issue of vagrancy was quite different for black women and white women. Black women who didn't earn a wage were actually sometimes picked up for vagrancy in states, whereas white women were not expected to earn a wage, and so they were treated differently by the law. So after ADC came into effect, it was the assumption that black women should continue to earn wages and white women should not? Not at all, unfortunately. We've had for a very long time, and to some extent still do, have a double standard about how mothers are supposed to behave. Uh, at the time, and this continued the tradition of the mother's pensions, it was assumed that a mother should de devote full time to staying home and taking care of her children. But in fact, although that was officially the standard, it was only really applied to so-called respectable white women. For example, in the southern states, even if a black woman uh, was able to get uh, named eligible for ADC, if there was a demand for people to work in the fields, her benefits would be ended and she re required to go out and work. That was very, very common in the southwest 
where a lot of Mexican-American women were uh, farm workers. Uh, it was also true that women were mm. expected to take domestic service jobs, working in the homes of people who are often only slightly richer than they were, but nevertheless to do that for very low wages rather than stay home with their children. Uh, the, these are, are traditions about women working that probably continued from slavery. On the other hand, though, there's also another side to this, and that is that for black women with a little education, there was great pride in women who did certain kinds of work, women who became school teachers in the uh, schools that were, that, which were, of course, completely segregated in the South. So you have a, a mixed set of values. One is the white assumption that women should stay home, but another is the assumption on both sides that it was all right for black women who were mothers to go out and work. And there is, of course, just to follow that tangent for a minute, there is, of course, the uh, possibility then within black families of educating daughters rather than sons because daughters had a greater possibility of obtaining work that could then support the rest of the family, whereas discrimination against black men meant that their possibilities were really limited. That's absolutely right. Absolutely. And that tradition carried on for quite a, quite a time because of discrimination that did not allow black men into white collar, let alone professional jobs. And, and we've learned that there's a double side to that too, which is that African American women then felt a much greater responsibility for breadwinning, if you like, you know, daughters, sisters, and so on, all pitched in to support families and young women and even married women felt that responsibility in a way that white women only came to do in the period after World War II. 